I'm going to read um, what is either uh, a couple of poems or a poem and a couple of parts. Um, so I was introduced to Dr. Charles Smith's work uh, back in October, formally introduced, because I come across it in, uh, in other spaces prior to that, but it was not until I was invited to be a part of this program that I got the opportunity to really engage with the work. And so first and foremost, let me just say how happy I am and glad I am and fortunate I am and blessed I am to be sitting next to this man right here, uh, whose work is so compelling. Uh, and so I'm going to read this uh, few pieces. This piece is called The Jester's Heresy, and it's based off of the sculpture of Like Father, Like Son, uh, Eternal Slave, which uh, was constructed somewhere between 1989 and 2002. That's correct. Yeah. All right, sir. Um, a black face smiles, wide, as though surprised to be invited under a gaze that falls, open and consuming, a spotlight beamed over a back bent low. When prompted, the safe face curves and its audience laughs, blind to the tinge in its show rabbit's eye. A tin guffaw echoed until gibberish or a foreign tongue tangled by the Holy Ghost. A smile this persuasive can win election landslide, can move the mass to believe a gold-plated lie. Black flesh knows no pain. The safe face, a stain, ordered, becomes a jabber of bones justified. Become, become the reason why. Its audience and abattoir they glare dull-eyed, foreground before torso, hanged and singed to crackling. Nobody say why. Billy club fingers cracked obsolete signal, end of sign. Boot heel hailstorm a brown head till the wise spatter over concrete's thousand teeth. Flesh in the cracks. The citizens feed, remembering how safe the inflated face, purple down in black water, when up from another light, the back skin of battle turned valley side and the black mouth singing, I'm tied, I'm tied, I'm tied and rising. The throng glares inside, a dull-eyed promise. In exchange for genocide postponed or slowed, this exact blood tie, a mask applied. If too black, black into not black. If not black, be. The safe face, when ordered, must oblige. Black wrist knotted from work wrangled, beating breast a barrel of air, lowers its rabbit eyes, gospel upturning the mouth, the body wide, the cheek slick with tear and snot trembling the plea to be safe but not kept. The brusque heft banged against the cruiser's chassis, thick fingers signaling end of sign, Nothing safe here survives. The black face smiles, end of time. The black face smiles, God's design. Black face unseen go out the end. O oh, Lazarus, reverse the tomb. Erupt you bones and gold tooth laughter. Your smiling face be safe for whom? Part two is this called good news because that was not the best news. <laughs> Good news of the gospel's coming, of the second coming, of the first, of the always right around the corner, always right inside your mind if only you pay attention, always open to being attended to, attention bound, always legible, intelligible, always lending itself to being read, a generosity of plain sight, always a celebration, always of the simplest, always of a flourish, an invariable variety, elegant, curved by the banner of its own becoming, good news, tomorrow will come, in a rush slowed to a brass-billed woodwind warbling, weighed in the water, God's gonna trouble, good news, God is not dead, is not hiding, is not afraid of his own darkness or of the darkness inside you. God know, knows what you don't, will help you find it if you ask. You can learn what to ask for if quiet with the yell in your body. Good news, your body is no more a temple than the bodies in which you suffer the pinch, the scrape, the cut, the break, the skeletons of stone and marble, of brick and wood and mud, bodies inside of bodies made of earth, 
air, water, space, time. You will not always yearn. One day you will cry a cry so wild it undoes the doing life has wrought you. One day you will look at what you think is a hole and find yourself staring back from the verge of your own closure. What's empty will fill itself when addressed, marked, named. You will say, there I am, and be there, and only there, and also here, in the mind of the reader, a growing voice whose crumbles sprout whose crumbs animate and spread, and there will be no aversion, and there will be no disgust with disorder, and there will be no disorder and no order, and there will be no words to say what is to come, and there will be no need for words or the things words refer to, and there will be only light, light, light. Thank you. That may seem loosely based, but I, I mean, first and foremost, um, maybe, well, you didn't ask me, but I, I think that what your piece did for me um, was, it made me meditate on the idea. It's a, it's a man sitting in a chair, a male form sitting in a chair, like father, like son, eternal slave, and you have this chain around him. And the chain reminded me, obviously, you know, there's the archetypal image of the slave chain. Right, then there's obviously the police. And there's a way in which being a black person in America, in my mind, um, has to do with being caught in a story, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would like to entryway into talking more about your work because the thing that struck me most directly when speaking to you the first time was that you have a very long sense of history. You know, you've experienced various things in your own lifetime, but the work that you create seems to be very much interested in the, pros in the, the process of creating history and of engaging these questions around that. So that's what I'm going to say to you, and I'm going to let you say whatever you want to say to that, because I know you can do that. <laughs> well, uh, first and foremost, I'm honored to be in the presence of those that's interested in the works of art and the projects that this young gentleman here is bringing forth. And I extend my highest, deepest respect for the Intuit organization, for the program that has set forth over the years, working with artists, creating artists, and supporting artists. And I certainly fit into all of those categories. My beginning was with Intuit. And it was because of them that I have reached the national and international fame that I enjoy in some areas. And I also feel that the most important thing about what we're doing today is shows a great highlight on what my focus is, and that is the young African American race. And this young man excites me just the moment's notice of hearing him speaking audibly and empowering authority and without shaking and quaking and making clear what he's thinking about and that's power mm -hmm. and I like that mm -hmm. you know and I feel that the only thing I'm going to leave with him when we get through here today and constantly share with him hit that like that in that authority about crime 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 that's what's killing us just like that chain was to that slave forever bound, you're never going anywhere. From plantation to the grave, you're going to be a slave. And everything come from your body, from the womb to the tomb, will be a slave. We overcame that. The authority of God, the universal power used by God, he set us free by other cultures, not like me. White people, Hispanic people, various other people of faith, Quaker and all alike set us free. That's where the word abolitionists come from. The minute that made their lives possible and laid it on the line, white people, Viola Luzo, gave her life. And then Reverend Reed beat the death for working with the voter rights and various other things of history that make us what we are today. And I don't want the young people to forget it. And I don't want the white people to forget it. And I don't want that line that seemed to be coming up on us. We got to choose the fight. Ferguson was wrong and I spoke long because for the simple fact it wasn't a white man killing a black boy in the street. You see the condition of what happens in life when you don't vote. 
when you don't get involved and you have a large percentage of the population of 67% and only one person on the council that magnified the depth of your ignorance. That's where the problem was. That was a big situation. And with me, I'm a Vietnam combat veteran. I didn't go over there to help nobody. I went over there to kill everybody because that's what they sent us for. That's what Marines do. And that's what had me so concerned in Ferguson for them to sit on top of that military equipment with an M60 machine gun. And I asked Brother Ferguson, who is the president of the Veterans for Peace, you must go to them and tell them to disarm that vehicle because once that rifle goes off, you will find parts all over St. Louis with that rifle when it goes off. That's an M60 machine gun. And you got to find a better way to do that because all you have to do is call out one military unit and they'll move like rabbits because there's no competition. Those are trained men. Those are just mad, angry citizens. So it's with that in mind, my work is focused around race and hatred and things of that nature. And I asked God one day in April of 68 when I saw the situation after Dr. King died, I said, Lord, in a shower, naked as a baby, Lord, help me. Put me in the fight in the way that would please you and honor our ancestors. And that's what I've been doing since that day. Grace of God, I've been in every prison in the state of Illinois, not as a convicted felon, but as a counselor, teaching them and reaching them, letting them know it's a better way with Christ. That's what we started with. We need to go back with. I attack black leadership as our fault and our shame. Our church as a dysfunctional place of society that has no meaning in the community. The fruits is there. You tell a tree by its fruit. And all of these things is done in my heart. I don't do art to entertain. I don't do art to make you feel good. I do art to activate and educate your mind and bring us together. And hearing it in the manner the way this young man speak, spoke tonight is something that I feel close to for a long time because I don't see very good, much good in our young people. When I see our young people, I see shame, pain. I see grandmothers crying. I see mothers sitting at funerals. I see the young men with their pants hanging so low you don't know whether they're going to the toilet or not. And these are the things that are taking place with us as a race of people. We have lost focus. And when we lose focus, we don't know what we want. It's like the people in New York complaining about the police shooting the young man, choking the young man, Eric Gardner, and all the crowd was out there. The white people want to know what well, we in this too. Black Lives Matter. Well, it got to matter to us first and then explain it to them why it matters. We can't explain it to them if you're killing one another every day. I live in Hammond, Louisiana, that's close to New Orleans. I was in New Orleans, and I came to Hammond because I didn't want to stay in that environment looking at that killing every day. Every day. I'm not talking about just yesterday. Every day. Of us, by us, about us. And thereby, my art and my travel take that load of discussing it with students, institutions around the country. And the highlight of it is that many of them have accepted, and them that don't, they might as well eat it and digest it because it's the truth. And there's nothing you can do with the truth but work with it and deal with it. And this is why I took the time to come here today to thank Intuit for supporting me over the years, and then to meet this marvelous young man. I spoke to him once on the phone when they told me that he and I would be talking. I sent him material that he should have for his uh, review, and I also sent him uh, the necessary news article about me that wasn't, uh, in my term, respectful of me, and I wanted his opinion, I wanted his involvement, because it's his fight, not mine. My life is made, I'm almost to the grave, I'm 77 years old. So it doesn't really matter which way it go, like Dr. King said, it doesn't matter now. Because I done been there and I got mine, you know, because I got work in the Smithsonian, the Houston Museum of Fine Art, and all youth institutions around the country.
that arch you see up on the wall there that in Aurora, the Kohler Foundation in Wisconsin came one day, we got in a discussion of what I'm about, what I'm doing with that art, hitting it hot, hard and heavy, and Kohler said, Dr. Smith, we can't get in that fight that you're in with the city of Aurora, but we can take your message and make sure it never dies. Kohler bought five tractor trailer loads, 40 foot of that art, mm -hmm. and distributed around the country. So you know I'm a very satisfied artist and no <laughs> my way of saying <laughs> So I gotta say some things. First, we yeah. just like <laughs> let the spirit be conversation. But I do wanna point out some things that you mentioned. You mentioned the article and I think it's a good I'm I'm interested in it. Uh, you know, what you what you said about the young generation, especially young blacks and the violence that uh, you as an elder uh, witness and perceive in the environment. So, and yet, the, the article to which you referred was by a, a journalist by the name of Louise Bostic. She's a white woman based in Louisiana Hammond. And basically what she's saying is that you are, uh, you don't love America in the same way in which she does. Well, your, your critique of the youth in some ways aligns with some of the ideas that you know she might argue for as well. So why do you think it is that despite the fact that as a Vietnam veteran f fighting for this country, as someone who does work on a regular basis that is you know nur nur nurturing and nur nourishing in, in nature, and as someone who is not afraid to critique black culture, you're still perceived by people like this person as someone who's just like, you know, revolutionary or anti-American. Well, anytime you find a problem uh, with a major situation, you're going to be put into the crosshairs of a rifle. Uh, I feel like uh, back in the day when uh, as black people, we as black men, we were looking for our manhood. We didn't know what it really was, or how it go, or what's happening. But when that brother stepped on the spotlight, Malcolm X, that did it. That did it. Malcolm hit it front and back, top and bottom, in and out, and he was so powerful with the preponderance of proof that the white people was wrong, the way they were dealing with us was wrong, the way they thought of us was wrong, and why he was doing what he was doing was the right way to do it, and he had all the power, power of Allah to do it. And the only problem he had was two things. One, that he based his whole process of dealing with the issue on one man, as the prophet Muhammad, Elijah. And that was wrong. You never base the move of God on flesh. Flesh will never do nothing but fail. And he found that in Elijah. And when he found that in Elijah, that broke most of his spirit, almost 80%. The other part he had was wrong when he made the trip to the motherland of the culture of the Muslim, that he went there and he saw blacks and white and all race of people. He really saw the sheep that Peter saw when God allowed him to see that he don't have just one people, he have all people. So rise and eat off that sheep. And that was his mistake. And like I teach artists in the art structure class, don't learn to be like famous artists, learn from their mistakes. Dr. Smith teaches on the mistake so that you can correct them. I critique African American because I'm the only one supposed to a black man elderly because you're supposed to be able to come to me and say, listen, brother, you've been on this earth 77 years. What have you done? Where are you stand? What have you contributed to the cause of black people and the economy that we're in? What do you do? Well, you saw my record. You know my record. Nobody pays me. Nobody gives me anything. God blesses me because I honor him. I give him the praise. I acknowledge him in all that I do. So the outcome is always going to be positive because it's his work and not mine. I didn't go to school for art. I asked God for a weapon. Just like that M60 on that machine gun. <laughs> give me something to fight. And that fight is on, brother. It is on. That woman is white. 
don't know anything about me. She came to me and said, Mr. Dr. Smith, you are an icon in the community. And everybody been calling downtown Hammond asking who you are and what you're about. And she came to me and said that what I'd like to do is interview you. And I told her, well, that would be fine because that's the best way uh, to introduce myself to the people of Hammond. I have been there five years. And my art was in the yard five years. The first piece I've done is the piece you see in that news article where I'm working on the Battle of Antietam where 37,000 men died in one day. So she came after all that art was in that yard and been there ever since 2005. And she came into my home, she came late. She came late. And any professional that's late in the manner of journalism, that's total disrespect. When she came late, she didn't apologize for being late. She came in and she said, well, let's talk. And I looked at her in such attitude, I said, wow, what is this? And then my mind told me, and the Holy Ghost gave me, said, Charles, remember, you're in the South. You are a second class, inferior person here forever. That's the way it is now, that's the way it was when I was a child, that's the way it is right now. So I told her, I said, well, let's go inside and talk. And she said, well, tell me uh, what you, where you've been, when you started, and who you are, because I already have written out uh, what it's about. And how, would, how could you do that and never talk to me? Mm -hmm. She said, well, I died. Well, hold it right now. Uh, this is not going right. What I want is an audience with the city council and the citizens of Hammond, Louisiana to explain to them my purpose for being here. I didn't move here, I'm assigned to be here. And I'm here to report my assignment to the people of Hammond. What I'd like for you to do is write in the article what I just said and tell them I would like to have a town hall meeting, blacks and whites and artists and others of interest in the city of Hammond. And she said, oh, you just want to find a place for your name and to build you up and so forth. And then this crap of stuff she wrote here, and I was reading it when I saw it, and I knew she hadn't been talking about me, but she didn't call my name. Because had she called my name, she would have found out the real Dr. Smith. <laughs> she would have found out the real Dr. Smith. When you disrespect Dr. Smith, you disrespect the total voice of God. Because I speak like the Bible says, 120 in the book of Psalms, the seventh verse, it says, I speak peace, but they talk war. Because I didn't come to fight nobody. How I arrived in Hammond, I was on my way to see my mother on a regular basis in Louisiana, New Orleans. I stopped in Hammond to get some gas. And every time I stop someplace, I always ask the culture people of color. I say, where's your museum, your African American history, or culture center? She said, we don't have one. And uh, in the kitchen, the guy that was cooking, he said, uh, oh, yes, uh, well, what about where that boy hung on that, what, what, on that tree and he fell? And they put that grave marker there. I said, what? What kind of conversation is that? And uh, he said, yeah, yeah, right down, right down there. No, right, no, it's over there. And that's the way they act in the South. They don't have no sense of direction. They just And I said, well, wait a minute, hold it, hold it, hold it. Uh, let me see how this works. And I start asking the people in the restaurant, I said, well, you know what he's talking about? And he said, no, I really don't. And the gentleman sitting over the far end of the restaurant, he said, oh, I know what they're talking about. They're talking about the founder's grave. It's uh, on Charles Street, down by the city hall, right by the block park. So I said, well, OK, I'm going to check this out. But it was getting late. So what I did, I went and checked into the hotel and stayed overnight. And as I did that, I went and found this place. It's called the Founder's Grave. And it says, here lies Pete Hammond, his wife, his three daughters, and his favorite slave boy. And that shit rang the bell with, oh, excuse me, 
That that rang the bell with me like, hey, let's get it on, you know, but this, this is it, you know, because that was no ordinary sign, that was a state sign. Meaning, in other words, they had not sanitized themselves from the fact that slavery to say, well, he was his favorite son, a favorite native boy, or African, or his name is Willie, or something of that nature. And I took offense to it. And so at that point, uh, I said, well, I'm going to ask around and find out what the boy's name was, where was the family located, and what the history they have here of African Americans. And when I did that, I went to all of the entities of power. All those that make decisions where the money goes, who spends it, the, the, uh, the downtown development, the tourist bureau, and the whole chamber of commerce, and white people and black people that look like they have sense. Because you don't talk to everybody like they got sense because they show they don't have sense. <laughs> but I talked to them and I asked them. And then they finally got to the point I was frustrated and I went and talked to the mayor. And I told the mayor, my name is Dr. Charles Smith, I'm traveling from Illinois to Louisiana, and I'm going to visit my mother who's in the situation of the Alzheimer's, and I drive this route two to three times a week, a month, uh, taking care of her, that's 978 miles. And I told him, I said, I saw a local sign by your founder's grave that says, here lies Pete Hammond, his wife, three daughters, and his favorite slave boy. And I asked him, I said, well, uh, who is the boy, where were they located, and what is the history of it? Do you have a cultural center where I can go and look into it and check it out and add it to my art portfolio of what town has African American history? He said, well, we don't have none of that. You probably can go to Southeastern University and check with Professor Hyde. And that was an insult for you to be the mayor, the main administrator of the city. You don't know who the boy is, you know, and that added to my frustration. So I said, well, okay, what I'll do. He said, oh, yeah, he said, there's a group of African Americans uh, trying to put together a black museum at the old colored school over there on the east side. And he said, they probably could be more of help to you. So that's what I did. I went over there where they were. There was about nine, maybe 10 of them, and the head man was Mr. Perkins. And I talked to him, and I told him about my concerns about that boy. I was concerned about you don't have a culture center, you don't have a museum, and there's a great deal of children here that need to know their history by the earliest stages to even the adults that don't know be living their history. So as time went on, I told him, I said, well, look, here's what we do. Since y'all got this building, what we'll do is put the museum together. Because what it takes to get a museum, you got to have art. And that's what Dr. Smith is known for. I got art. I got a lot of art. And I shipped it from Illinois to here and what I have in New Orleans to here, and we'll build this museum. But first, we got to put the strategy together to attack the white forces that's going to come against us. Because they don't want you to have nothing until they rule it or control it or have complete interest in what you're doing. So what we'll do, we'll meet them individually, the mayor, the state senator, the politicians, and bring them into the room one by one and tell them why we need this museum for our kids, to save our young men from <coughs> gangs and drugs, to save our young men from walking off from their children and leaving them for the welfare agency eating that cheese and that food stamp program and get them back on solid ground. And they understood that. They said, wow, yeah. So once you get a white man here going like that when you ask him for money, that means you got him. That's one down. And we went through all of them, congressmen and all of them. We got them all to agree so that when we had that meeting, the white people and the black people were sitting there saying, yeah, we get in the museum. Yeah, we get in the museum. And they put the money in there. And they started working with it. And I showed them what you have to teach. Let's go back and do Kwanzaa. Never mind Christmas. Christmas keeps you stupid, keeps you in debt, and keeps you making promises you can't keep. But if you go back to what Professor Marenghi came out with a revelation from God, let's do the seven principles of Kwanzaa. That way you can measure yourself. First you got to unite, boom. 
become one. And anybody come against that one, that's the fist of God. That's the power of you together. See, that's why they don't have nothing now. Black don't own nothing, don't control nothing, they ain't about nothing. They go to church on Sunday and the man collect the money and carry it to a white man bank on Monday and it leaves you stupid on Wednesday and can you to a predatory loan to try and pay your rent. See, and you're out of the picture all together without a bullet being fired. And they understood that. So they said, Dr. Smith left roll and we rolled. And I told him, I said, what I'll do, I don't want no part <clears throat> of the museum. All I want to know is die with the fact in my resume, Dr. Smith passed by here and he helped us and we rolled. We teaching our children. We got history going. We ain't in Mardi Gras. We ain't jumping up and down with a horn in our mouth, second line and acting a fool. We got positive things going. We reaching the children in rural areas. We helping the old folk that don't have nothing. We doing positive things. White folk look at us now with respect, pride, and dignity as a people of culture. So, honey, that <laughs> died. That died, and that's my warning to anybody and everybody working with black folk. Be sure you be doing whatever you're doing. They first doing it to the glory of God. Because the pain and disappointment is beyond one able to understand. When that got them people started, put that museum together, built that art around that house, and I told them the house would be theirs and the art would be an attraction for tourists coming from around the country, they cut Dr. Smith's throat and left Dr. Smith in the cold. And by the grace of God, that's where my star came and that's how the end, I stayed with God. She's a liar. Everything she wrote is a liar. The council said the council is racist. The black folk is ignorant. And it's a condition that you'll see wherever you go when you don't have no control of nothing. <coughs> That's Ferguson part two. The killing hadn't taken place yet, but it's there. This is the whole story. This is Dr. Smith's fight. That's how I started in Aurora. I told them white people in Illinois that you can't have seven museums of historical significance and none respecting us, identifying us. We fought for this country. We defended it at all times, never ran away from a war, and thereby we built this country on the backs of our ancestors. We deserve a museum, and we got one. And that's how I started. That's how Dr. Smith started in Aurora, Illinois. We were working it in a way that meant business. And right now, that museum set in disarray because of the same sickness and disease that they had been hammered, black ignorance and white racism. So I'm open for questions. <laughs> I have one, one more question I want to ask you that relates directly to, well, you can get your money worth. Uh, it, re it relates directly to, uh, so when you were 14 or 15, uh, this is a story, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. There, it was the same time that another young Chicagoan uh, went down to Mississippi, Money, Mississippi, by the name of Emmett Till. And he, you and him were the same age at the That's time right. when he was killed. That's right. It was a, an experience that, at least in the reports uh, around your creativity and your craft, stayed with you for a long time like it did in many other people. It changed, changed, changed your approach to life. What I want to know is, how did that affect you is the first part. And the second part is that in the contemporary times, you know, we talk about young people today. How do you think young people today are being affected by news that is similar to that? Which is to say, young black people being killed, whether it be by police or by other young black people, but just the fact of knowing the details of someone that's your own age when you're so young and impressionable. Um, being killed, and how does that relate? So those are the two questions. What did, how did that affect you, and how do you think people are being affected today? Who are young? Well, it affected me primarily and all of them at my age, and blacks and whites, the whole world. Uh, the way it was done, it was just a blatant disregard for law and justice. <laughs> it was just two racist white men that went in a man's home without responsibility of law, without a warrant or anything, and took him out of that bed, 
in Canada in that barn and they beat him senseless and used tools in the barn to beat him. They used all manner of uh, equipment to beat him. And then when they finally didn't have no more flesh to beat visibly to see, they put a big old windmill fan on him and then threw him in the Tallahatchie River. And the shame of it was is that his mother wouldn't even allow them to show the casket closed. She said, open it up. And all the young men at that time, racism was still a major picture on the scene of life at that time. And whenever you went uh, anywhere, that was the way your mother controlled you, your family. Boy, you go around there talking to them white folk. Hey, them white folk long. Because they know and they knew then that them white folk could kill you and there was no justice. There was, you were not even going to court. And, and the idea of that was, to me, what affected me so, I didn't want to go and look at that boy like that in that casket. And she dragged me on. She said, you coming? Because she felt at that time it was a disciplinary measure for me to shut my mouth <laughs> and stop acting up or whatever, you know, young people do. And when I got there, Mother Mamie Till Mobley had came through the door. And when she came through the door, she didn't even make it to the casket. She was halfway. And when she went down like that to the floor, big brother, big brother, like that young man, that he, he, they couldn't pick her up. I never saw anything like that in my life. They couldn't pick her up. She was crying and hollering so until everybody in the place started crying. And the whole building just looked like it was shaking. And it looked like God wasn't nowhere touching nobody to heal them. It was so much pain. And everybody said, Lord God Almighty. And it was so hard to get through it because at that time, uh, it wasn't making sense. It, it's not like the comparison that you're making today with young people. Young people today just dying stupidly. They're not trained. They don't have a father. They don't have a family structure. And then when they get involved with the police, they don't know what to do and how to do it, when to do it. And the police know the best outcome is for them to do like they teach one another. It's better for me to be judged by 12 of my peers than to be cared by six of my friends. Just kill a nigga. That's all it is to it. Let it alone. Kill him. And that's it. You know, every day. See, but if you get stopped, Stop. Whatever crime they're chasing you for, the crime stops right there. When the light goes on, beep, beep, stop. Get out, ask for a direction. What do you want me to do? Put your hand over your head. Put your hand behind you. Put your hand on. Get on the ground. Fall down. Crawl to me. Follow them instructions. Because anything outside of the instructions, you're playing with death. Young men have attitude. And you can't deal with them because they wasn't disciplined at home. And the only way you discipline them in the street is they be in the gang and they bring them up and put ten guys on them and whoop it behind. Then he understand. Pain is a serious teacher. And that's what they respond to. They don't respond to, hey, brother, don't do that. That's not the way to do that. And that's the problem. Every crime you see, just like the one that's recent, the brother knocked the taser out of the police hand and he ran. Now what do you think that police gonna do? He's gonna shoot, even though he lied and they caught him on the camera, so I him put the gun by the boy and the boy was innocent. It doesn't matter. You going into a controversy of who killing who and the court and them boys is dead. They still dead. No matter how much court you want, no matter how much justice you want, that boy is dead. When they did Rodney King, I, st I put a piece up, you might see it on the screen, is Rodney King. When they beat Rodney King like that, I had a similar feeling about like Emmett Till. Man, wow, what a beating. And that's one thing I say about black folk. They the most endurable people in the world. You can beat them, brother, I don't care what you say. In the morning, they're going to get up and go to work. They can take a whooping, brother. That's a slave tradition <laughs> that goes by I me. Mean, they can take a I've seen them both in prison. I've seen ten brothers jump on one brother to try and bring him in line, and they couldn't do nothing with him. 
They beating him and hitting him in the eye, and that, that, that brother was steady rolling. He was moving and getting around and doing what he had to do. And that in itself is not acceptable, because when you get through, you're dead. And that's the difference. Our problem is black leadership. The problem is the church. Those are the two entities ordained of God to move forward, to help, and deal with them young men. I don't care how big they are, how bad they are, God can bring them subject. If he can bring Paul subject on the Damascus road and knock him off that horse and tell him who he is, then he'll sure do the same with you if prayer come in there. But they're not praying. They're not moving toward God for God to add to his army. That's the difference between them young men today and the young man of Emmett Till. He was totally innocent. He was just a young boy enjoying his life as a young man because he was from the north and they hadn't told him the rules in the south. Just like I had to learn the rules of the south when I moved back to Hammond. When you're a black man and strong in your authority of life, you go to Louisiana or anywhere in that south, you step down three grades. Step down three grades and you live and enjoy life a lot longer. Because them white folks down there haven't changed. They haven't changed. And that's why teaching is important. That's what I do with the art, with the young men that come in the art yard. I told them, you identify a police by his badge or the car number and the date he came by or whatever it took place. And then you care to the proper authority. And you get the admiral, the ad, 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 admiral number, or you get an ombudsman or a mediator to go with you. We had that at a certain time. It used to be called the NAACP, SCLC, Operation Put, and the United Negroes in College having fun. See, all of that did. That did. All of that did. They still talk about it and honor it, but everybody knows in their right mind that that did. That's just like Jesse Jackson Jr. He in jail, and his daddy is dead. Push is dead. Everything is dead, dead. That's why them young boys out there doing the best they can, what they can, sell some reaper, pimp some holes, slime cat like those, do what they want, sing nasty song, and then do what they got to do. And the white man say, I'm going to give you a contract. You going on TV. And thereby you become what you are on TV, talking about the empire, living that old phony life that don't nobody know about. And then we already know common sense that Bill Cobb is guilty. He guilty of sin. Because any man you attack his character, that's the first thing he going to stand up and fight. It's just like when you were younger and somebody said, your mama ain't nothing, brother. You got it home. Well, that's the same as your character. They done slapped him. And 24, 25 white women and two, three black ones ain't wrong. Mm -hmm. who, who mad at you to tell a lie like that and get a group together to do that? Put him on trial. And if you don't put him on trial, then he goes into the court of public opinion. And the public opinion is at this time, everybody, if you had everybody in the room, say, you think he gives it? Hell yeah, he gives it. And they'll tell you. Because that's public opinion. And that's where you stand when you're dealing with issues, my brother. Those things are not in place. We got 105 black colleges. Which one of them is working on crime? Which one is working on housing? Which one is working on social services? Which one is working on political justice? Which one is working on families? Which one is working on senior citizens? Which one is working on these young girls, 14 years old, having babies and talking, I can do it myself? You can't do nothing but comb your hat. That's all you can do. Nobody's doing nothing, and then they're not even accountable to nobody. They use us as pawns. Yeah, we represent the African-American community, and if you don't give us no money, we'll have 400 people in front of your business within two weeks telling you that you're wrong. And the white man want his business to keep rolling. Well, I'm going to give you a check. See, that's what they charge that they are shopping with. But those that free in mind, body, and spirit, the hell with they doing that's not right, stand in God and keep going forward. That's all I tell you. Keep going. That's what I wrote to you. The last note, brother, keep going strong. And now that I met you tonight with your voice and articulation, the way you do it, you would be a hell of a brother in terms of putting that together. But take that, what you read, and turn it to crime. 
tell him I'm the poet of crime. Why we die? I know why. Because we don't care and nobody understands. We left out here by ourselves. We like a willow tree just rolling across the desert and nobody cares. And see, God will hear you and God will add strength to you and faith to you. He did it to me. When I was broke, didn't have nothing, I told my old lady, I said, we need some money. And I didn't know what to do. And God blessed me, man. I went to the post office and there was a little letter in the post office, and I read the letter, and I said, oh, somebody said $10, that's something. But I said, they got that wrong, man. That's zero. That's in the wrong place, ain't it? Mm. And lo and behold, man, that was $10,000. <laughs> Somebody has sent for to carry on the work. And I've been like that ever since. And when God blessed me with cola, that was the same thing. And I promised God, I said, I'll get on the road. And that lady we talking about, that son you talking about, God blessed me to meet Mother Mammy Tia Mobley. I brought her to Aurora, to the site. Her and Rosa Park, we sat down and we talked. Because when you done lost something close to you and personal, can't know anybody talk to you. There ain't no such thing as a psychiatrist. Ain't no such thing as a psychologist. Those are just big names they use for white folk reading books that they don't understand what's happening. But the problem is, God blessed me to meet Mother Mamie Till Mobley. And she came to the museum, she sat there, and that piece I had representing her son, I thought that she would be angry, but she wasn't. She started crying. She said, Dr. Smith, she said, I thank you so much for this. And what you need to do, since you're having such problems with these people, you need to take your show on the road. And that's what my dream came to and manifested with me with my 24-foot box truck, red with big yellow writing on it, saying, welcome home, start living. For the 7,427 African Americans that died in Vietnam that nobody knows about, nobody cares about, nobody hears about it, and nobody seems to understand that that was lies lost. When you got that information from the Pentagon, they had zeros by their name. And the meaning that they didn't serve no time in the military. When they got drafted, they got drafted to go to Vietnam and they died got killed. And blacks don't have no memorial fund. They don't have anything. If the white folk hadn't put that one in Washington, they would have still been wondering, was it any blacks in Vietnam? Was it any blacks in Afghanistan or Iraq? They done died. They, the, the, the black people died when Dr. King died. The only way you can measure that difference is measure the leaders, call them into accountability, and like you said, brother, what's your record after this? You know, and let them explain. They said they're not, they're not, and I don't never apologize for taking up a lot of time when I go anywhere. When you call Dr. Smith, you don't call a radio that don't have no knob. <laughs> <laughs> Is that an indication, Joel? We have time for Q&A. Okay, so uh, audience, just jump right in. You see where we are? We've been blessed with the ideas. Let's, just, let's see what we got. I'll start it off. I just I'm have this question about this notion of assignment. You said a lot, and I appreciate every, I'm sure I'm not alone. I feel like I'm at the right place at the right time because you're speaking from a place of wisdom and I respect it and I'm just open to it. But you said something that I just want to hear you speak a little bit more about and maybe you too as well, um, RJ. This notion of assignment is something that really touches me and I believe it. I, I believe in my own life that I'm not in places that I want to be. I'm not interested in places I want to be. I'll go and visit them. I'm really interested in this notion of being on assignment and taking, and taking joy in knowing that there's work for you to do and also being able to hear that there's work for you to do in a particular place. So maybe I'll ask you first to talk about if that resonates for you, <coughs> this notion of assignment, um, and you know what that, if it resonates for you, and then I'll ask um, Dr. Swift to talk about it. So I'll say um, yes is the short answer. Uh, it does it does resonate the idea of feeling like I'm there's something that is intended or meant that is not my conscious choice 
uh, is definitely a part of it and definitely relates to the work that I do and it relates to where I am. I know that when I came to Chicago, it wasn't because I had a job here or anything. It was because I felt like my destiny and the destiny of the city were tied up in one another in a way. And so I just, I, I've, I've been driven in, in various times in my own life uh, from a place that I could, I could certainly say is in some ways unknown to me, but is known in a different kind of way. I would have to call it God, I would have to call it divine intervention, or I could call it fate, or you could call it whatever else, but whatever it is, it's not my own decision um, that is driving me to create a certain kind of work and to be in certain kinds of places and to respond to it. And as, a, as, as Dr. Smith said earlier, there's a way in which when you do, when you follow whatever it is, that little urge or voice inside you, there's you get confirmation, something happens that's like, okay, it's like you push toward it and it pulls you. And there are scriptures that align with that, obviously, you know, that's this idea of like you take one step toward the divine, it takes ten toward you, and sacrificing in the, in the, in the, in the spirit of, of following something that's driving you. So I would say, again, to keep it relatively short, yes, uh, I do, I do well believe said. in that. Well said, well said, Thank you. well said. <laughs> well, well, let me just put it to you this way. You've heard people say uh, there's a calling and on your life. Well, I knew in April of 68 a monumental moment in my life when it's scripturally based, nobody can deny it. And once you start down that road, see, nobody can beat your testimony. When I went in those jail cells where those big old brothers were and murderers and rapists and, and we beating on one another every day and pumping iron and everything and the training was to put you in the cell with them and then when they closed that iron door you one of them but you're not convicted with them and you haven't been to no trial. Your job is to go in there and expound on the word of God. What he done for you. And when I went in there, I was afraid like anybody would be in the flush, stepping in strange territory with the monstrous type guy. But the spirit on the inside of me says, stand. Stand fast. Stand fast in the liberty where I set you free. And when I start testifying to him what God done for me, I wasn't always a great guy. But I knew right then and there, once I start testifying, they couldn't take my testimony. That was the greatest thing that Apostle Paul had. He was the greatest hater of the church, of the people of God, the Jews. He was going around killing them everywhere he found them. But in the book of Acts, in the ninth chapter, he was riding going toward to get some more of them. And all of a sudden, God was tired of it and knew that it was time to get him a message. And the best messenger God got is somebody that's going to get it done. He don't need a lady well-dressed. A ten-cent whore will do. And that's what he got when he got Rehab the Harlem. When he got down on Paul on that Damascus road and that man's testimony when he got up, there was nothing equal to Paul. You can bring artists from around the country. I don't care where you bring them from. They say, well, Dr. Smith, we're going to have to have a jury to your art. You can't jury my art. How you going to take something like Dr. Smith did with nothing, from nothing, ain't got nothing, and giving the glory to God, and he told me what institution he went to teach him, and I'm here going to the Smithsonian, the Houston Museum of Fine Art, getting $15,000 for lectures on art, teaching and talking about art, and God done all of that. How you going to beat that? You know what I mean? How you going to judge that? Who you going to put me up against? And thereby is what I'm saying. When you show what you want to do, give God that impression. God, I'm coming. Just meet me on the road. And he'll do it. I know he, he won't leave you wondering. He'll, he'll do it. He didn't have me in the midst of people. And the whole room was lily white. I cut through there just like I'm doing here, black, white, a few, or a thousand. It don't matter to me. A crowd don't scare me, and a few don't discourage me. I keep right on going because I know God is with me. I don't intend no harm to nobody. I want to leave this life saying like Ezekiel did. Lord, I told him. 
and the blood is off my hand, and you do what you want to do with your life. This young man has a joy, and you can feel it. Old preacher used to say, boy, I can feel that in you. You read it. He read it. Only thing I can add to him, jump off of the discussion of things that might be, what, what, what did he say? Crime. <laughs> Hit crime. Hit crime. Hit crime. It's just like a bank vault. You can't get in. Just keep hitting that lock with that sludge hammer. You'll get in there because you can reach him. See, when I talk to him, oh, he just, oh, yeah. Well, I've been where you gone. I know what you want to do. How you think I'm just old? God leave old folk here for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to show you where to go and how to go. Now you done got them so scared of you, they don't want to be bothered with you. Mm -hmm. They just watching you die. They won't stop you and say nothing. I talk to the young brothers in the neighborhood. You know, hey, hey, bro, you and that young lady, y'all need to make up your mind what you're going to do. Go to school <laughs> or just get married or have a baby. What you going to do? Because the results is in the community. Just call his name. Everybody know everybody in the community. I said, you see what happened to Jesse, don't you? You see what happened to Roy, don't you? That kind of thing. You are the lead, whether they like it or not. You are the lead. Just tell them. And when you find what you want to do in life, tell them that's what I'm good at. That's what I'm good. I do it. And anything they put me in, I tell them, God, just give me a chance. Just give me a chance. I'll make it work. And it has worked. It has worked. And that's all you, you don't need nobody but God. You don't need nobody to prove. They all, but Dr. Smith, what's your credentials, your academic credentials? There's no college teaching this. There's no college putting this out. Yes. Are you crazy asking me for my credentials? Go to Aurora, Illinois and look on the corner of Kendall and North at that site. Go to Hammond, Louisiana and look at that site on Walnut, Louisiana. Go to the Cola Foundation in Sheboygan, Wisconsin and ask them, who is Dr. Charles Smith? Go to the Art Institute in Chicago and ask for Mr. Bob, uh, Jim Danzig and Professor Lisa Snow, who is Dr. Charles Smith? And when they get through talking to you, and when you get through checking those places I told you to check, they say, hell, he got something deeper than a doctorate degree, I can tell you that. Mm. You understand? Mm. And all the students that I've met over the years working with the Art Institute through Professor Jim Zanz and them and those of the Roger Brown Study Center. Because there's people in there like you should be there mixing with them, changing ideas and learning encouragement and learning pitfalls and what to do and how to do. Like I tell them in art, this brother's art show that's here that died. You know, I wasn't satisfied how I died because I told him before he died, brother, we got to come up with a plan because the inevitable is going to happen. You're going to die or di disable, and we ought to have a blocking force like in the Marine Corps. You can't come through that flank unless you come through me. And he died like that, and his art is scattered in Louisiana and various places because he didn't follow the plan. He don't have a plan. And that was the key. And I wasn't here to say, well, don't put no dark right on nobody. I'm telling you the truth. So your answer <laughs> is find where you want to go and go down that road like I 55, like I do, and stay in that left lane. And anything in that left lane, they mean business. Woo! They don't care about no kicking. Because if you get him, I'm coming through. That's all it is. That's what it's about, sister. That's what life is about. You're a beautiful sister. Find your life and then keep going. Don't let nothing stop you. If your wife, your husband stop. Baby, sit down. We got to have a talk. <laughs> your boyfriend, baby, we got to have a talk. Because my mind is made up like I did with my woman. I do, baby, 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 baby. <laughs> Listen, there's nothing reign supreme in this house but this house. Well, we, got, we ain't got to do nothing. But you got to follow this art and I'm following God. Because if you don't, we got to do what we got to do right now. Because we do art counseling to artists for death, disabilities, and marriage counseling. And brother, if she's not with you, get rid of her. Get rid of her. If she's not, get rid of him. Because there's a weight and a, a baggage to you you can't use. Because like the Bible says, let us lay aside every weight Tell and it. sin that so easily beset us. 
Have your arm moving free with that sword of life, cutting down anything in front of you, cutting anything in back of you. And that way you make it. But as long as you tired to somebody and doing something and wanting to do something, it's like being married to a crackhead. Everything he tells you is a lie. Everything. So the point of it is, and that's a subject matter, <coughs> individual get studied, stand fast, and go forward. I don't care what your career is. I don't care what it is. You can be anything and everything if you got a focus and God is in your plan. Acknowledge God in all your ways and he'll direct your path. Because he knows you lost in North America. He knows that. Mm. See, and he'll add to you what you need. What I'm saying to you, that's what your pastor, the church, will be putting in them young people, encouraging them, carrying them through, not endorsing their funeral. Tell me it's a sad day for the Jones family. The boy died, and, and then, well, he shot in the back of the head. We don't know why. See, just keep talking about the word. Let the word condemn it. Your life condemns you. Can't nobody fix up no obituary, straightening up your life, and you the crook all along. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Anyone else have any questions? You feel like you've been bathed in the holy water. Thank you so thank much to you both. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Charles Smith. It is such a pleasure to see you. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Uh, it's especially uh, poignant for me, you know, you, you're an elder, and it's, it's something that weighs heavily on my soul, because one of my, my elders, my great-grandmother, actually just passed away, and tomorrow I have to speak at uh, her funeral. And so, thinking about how it is, thank you, how it is that, um, you know, those who have experienced so much uh, and have so much to teach us, um, and how quickly time can pass, it is uh, it's a great gift to you know, be able to sit next to someone who's experienced such history and who has such clarity around uh, your, your, your world experiences to help continue to guide us forward. So I appreciate you sitting here. And I appreciate your art because it, was, uh, it is, continues to be an inspiration uh, for me. So can we clap it up one more time?